So, first of all, l'chaim, l'chaim, everybody. L'chaim. Beautiful, uh, it's a beautiful moments here. Beautiful time to be together tonight. We're trying something very different. This is our first time doing a hybrid. We're going to be here with you, and we're going to be also in person, which is very exciting. We are talking tonight about relationship goals. Now, just to set the tone for this evening, a um, couple important things. Number one is for those of you who are online and those of you who are not online, but since there's singles here, I think it's important to make sure that there's possibility of people having conversations. So if you are interested in having a conversation with here tonight, I really like give an example of um, right over here, Robert Goldman is an example. He says A, which means available. He gives his age range. He gives his somewhat religious orientation and his name. So that way you can see right away if you want to have a conversation with Robert. So thank you for being my example tonight. Shannon, thank you as well. So if anybody else wants to change their name, it's really easy. You just go to your name. You go to more. You can change. You can go to rename and then just rename you yourself to either A or N-A. Um, and then you can see if you can have any conversations with anyone in the room here this evening who may be of your age range or perhaps with a disorientation. You never know. You never know. So uh, also, we want to give a very special thanks to Maurice Benoff and BG Communications for sponsoring tonight's class. Actually, uh, it's because of her that we're actually having this class. If anybody wants to uh, sponsor the next class, we're happy to continue this series. Uh, and it's very, very easy uh, to be able to do that and let me know. Also, any of the money that was uh, anyone gave towards this, this class tonight is going to help. There's a, a bride that we're trying to help, and it's a very special uh, omen to be able to help a bride uh, prepare for her uh, for her special wedding day, and we're going to help and, and give that money towards it. Also, um, if you don't have a profile on J Matchmaking or J Montreal, make a profile. There's a couple of reasons why you want to make a profile besides of how easy it is for us to be able to match you uh, through the AI system there. What's also very good about it is it doesn't cost anything, and we are starting a series of curated uh, um, meetings. And so therefore, the only way you can get involved with this curated meeting is if you have a profile on J Matchmaking or on J Montreal. And so please, for those of you who don't have a profile, make one. That's all of my uh, preamble. Let's get started. Oh, one more thing. Very important. You can't hear me. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Does anybody can hear me? You're good? Okay, good. So people can hear me. Okay, here's another very important thing tonight. Um, I always like to take anonymous questions. So anonymous questions over here are gonna be in person in this bowl. But if you're not in person, what's gonna happen is the following. If you can see, you can send them an anonymous question to Olivia. You see my co-host on the top, Olivia? She's right here next to me. And she will then be writing your questions on these cards. I will not know even if it came from you. She will be writing these questions and putting it in the bowl. So I will be at the end of my talk tonight, be taking this bowl, answering all the questions that are in this bowl. And I don't know if it came from somebody in person here or if it came from somebody online. So this is going to be a really exciting uh, time. Our favorite part of this evening's program is going to be, of course, the open questions and answers. So with that, I'm, you're going to see, I'm going to sometimes be looking at you. Sometimes we're looking at all of you because this is trying to find my groove with this first time that I'm trying this hybrid type of class here tonight. So you'll have to bear with me. And then afterwards, you can send me all your tomatoes. Okay. Relationship goals. Think about what comes to mind the moment you hear the word relationship goals. Does anybody think that it's important and please, you can write it in the chat. Use the chat box. Write it in the chat. Um, it, does, does anybody think that it's important to have relationship goals? 
Give an example. Of a relationship goal? A relationship goal, yeah. A relationship goal. Hmm? Marriage. Marriage is a relationship goal. Uh, that's the big M word. I don't know if anyone wants to talk about the big M word tonight. Mm -hmm. Compatibility. Compatibility, a relationship goal. Okay, so that so if I heard a, so let's say we take the word compatibility. That's not a relationship goal. That is an element of uh, that is important for a relationship, but not a goal. I'm asking about a relationship goal, which means you can get into a relationship and you can just kind of be like you're going on a joyride. Where are you going? I don't know where I'm going. Does it matter where I'm going? Going on a joyride. Or you can have a destination. That was a big difference between those two experiences, going on a jo joyride or having a destination. There's also a plus and a minus to each of them, which means there's an advantage to the spontaneity of not having a goal. But then where are you going? And then you can turn around three, four, five, seven years later, and you're like, what just happened to the past seven years? Anyone can relate to that? Okay, just saying. I don't know, seven years, even seven months. It doesn't matter, even seven weeks. Mm -hmm. What else? Communication. Communication, okay. That's a goal, I guess. Yeah. Being able to communicate well. Mm -hmm. Having trust. Trust? Okay. So these are all really important factors in relationships, and I've spoken about this before. They're not relationship goals. Respect. These are all wonderful things. And I and I like these, these are really important elements of relationships, but not relationship goals. But isn't everyone's goal to get married? And that's it. Is, that's the main well, gist of it. I'm not here to tell you. I don't want to speak for you. You know, if everyone's goal to get married is a wonderful thing, but I'm not here. I'm not here to I'm not here to speak for you. But why are we dating? Like, are we just dating just for the hell of it? No. We're dating because there's a purpose at the end. We see the light at the end of the tunnel. I think it's very easy to say that. I think it's very easy to say the companionship and that you're dating because you have a purpose. But I know very good and well, and you know too, that that's not the way that our system is not so easy going that way. Marriage usually leads to family, children. Okay. Marriage usually leads to family, children. Yeah. So tonight, I want to talk about a couple of ideas. The, the ideas that I want to bring forth tonight uh, are not my own. I learned them from a good friend of mine, Dr. Asel Romanelli. And I think that maybe there's something that within his, within his uh, world that we can bring into our world and see what that means. So one of the things that he talks about is systematic or systemic therapy. Systemic therapy is essentially that no individual lives in a vacuum, that we're all part of a bigger system. And this wider system includes our partner, it includes our siblings, it includes our family, our community, our society, our country, and ultimately our species. And by definition, systems are greater than the sum of their parts and larger than the individuals that make up those systems. Relationships within a system are defined as patterns that repeat over and over. Now, I'm sure you're going to say this, and he says the same thing, that, that that idea is a little cold. It's a little technical. But what happens is, is that if a human, if a human that's part of nature and not above it, something that we often forget, that we're actually within nature, then the order of nature is also the order for us. And the systemic approach is circular. So for example, and I know I'm kind of talking in circles right now, actually my words are circular because I think it's good 
because and you're saying, like, what is he talking about? But th think about it a second. That let's say we're, we were global minded, which means that we connect micro and macro. We can connect small things and big things, which means let's say our relationship is bigger than, than just the two of us. We're in a relationship, but the relationship is not just the two of us. I mean, if we lived in an island alone in the middle of nowhere, then there'd be two people in a relationship on an island alone in the middle of nowhere. But we actually live as part of a society. So therefore, the relationship is not just the two of us. And these patterns of that we create, especially the relationships we create outside of, let's say, our romantic relationship, they are constantly resisting change. I'll go right to the jugular. Guy brings home a girl, mother hates her. Typical story. Why does the mother hate her? The mother doesn't hate her. The mother's afraid that by her son getting into a relationship, she's going to lose her relationship with her son. So she is being selfish. And she's going to say, I hate this person because she's afraid of losing her son. But we, we know good and well that that is a very selfish thing for her to do, but she can't help it. So let's take a look at the son's perspective now. He has a relationship with his mother. So the woman he's dating can't start walking into a relationship saying, oh, well, you live on an island all alone and everything has to be all about me. No, you, you have a relationship with other people. And so there's this, all of a sudden, the moment you enter a relationship, there starts becoming this tug of war between all of the elements of your life. And the longer you've been alone, the more you have all these elements of our lives. There are some people who avoid relationships because they're afraid of this, because they either consciously or subconsciously know that there's going to be this tug of war between all the elements of their lives. So what we have to look at is that your relationship is not one-sided. It's a circular relationship. You live within the confines of a society, of a particular uh, status, of a particular place. And because of that, you cannot see your relationship as the two of you. Now, I will talk about soon that relationship needs to be the two of you against the world. And I'm a huge, most important, which means it is true that your relationship should take priority over everything else. But two things. Number one, that can't happen instantly, which often people want that to happen instantly. And number two, which I think is even more important, is you have to understand there's other people in that. So when right away, you know, it's the typical story. It's a typical mother-in-law story. That's why I'm, I'm using it as an example, mm -hmm. even though some of us unfortunately don't have that or it's not realistic, but it's a typical mother-in-law story where there, there, there's a tug of war between the, 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 there's a boy and he now has two women in his life. <laughs> and so there's going to be a tug of war between those two women or there's a woman and now there's two, there's two people in her life. It's her mother or father or it's, or it's, and it's, and it's her boyfriend. And so we're having this real tug of war and that's a big issue. So your life is not linear. Your life is circular. So when you look at your relationship, you can't see your relationship as two individuals. You have to see a system, what Dr. Romanelli calls a dance. You have to see a dynamic dance where the two of you are both moving independently. And as you constantly influence each other, every move that one partner makes impacts the other. And there's no such a thing as, it's your fault, I'm okay. Or it's my fault, don't worry about it. The first lesson that we have to learn in our relationships is that we have to take ownership over the place that we're in. And I say this so often, and a lot of people hate what they, they always hate. Rap, I don't say this anymore, don't say it anymore. But you are the common denominator in all your failed relationships. 
Whatever you've done in your life, any choice you've made, it's you. It's not the other. Yes, there was someone else, but it's you. And you. the moment we're able to take ownership over our own lives, over the things that we do in our lives, that's the time where we can say, I'm here, and now I'm looking towards here. So I'm not saying that a relationship goal, let's say marriage is not important to you. I'm not here. I'm not here to make choices for you. I'm a very big proponent of marriage. You all know that. But I'm not here to make your choice. I can't live your life for you. So let's say marriage is not important to you. I still think you need to have some type of goal in your relationship. But that goal needs to be understood that it can't be a, it can't be a black and white goal. It has to be a fluid and dynamic goal in the relationship. And by the way, I know because I've seen this so often that it's very hard for couples to accept this because it's normal for us to think that our partner is the cause of all our relational problems. And of course, our personal problems as well, because we didn't have any problems before the other person showed up. Everything was wonderful because I, I, don't, I don't have any problems. You have problems? No, I'm perfect. I'm a perfect person. I never had any problems before. All of a sudden, you showed up and everything went haywire. So it's all your fault. And if we're not taught to own our problems from a young age, we are naturally going to blame others for our problems. We're going to blame others for our habits. And when we're feeling pain, when we're feeling despair, the easiest target is going to be the person right next to us because they're an easy target. Because in our mind, we know they're going to be there tomorrow. We're not worried about them running off. And so that can be a little, little, little thing that becomes a big thing. A lot of little things can become a big thing. So even though it feels better, and maybe it even feels more just in a way, it, also, it often leads to who's right and who's wrong. And it becomes this tug of war that we don't need. And it suffocates the relationship. So thinking systematically, and then also thinking in circles, dynamic, I think it's the best way for any of us to keep ourselves accountable and keep ourselves open to change. Now, this, this idea of having some kind of relationship focus or some kind of relationship goal is bigger than just the two of you because it means that your behavior is shaped and influenced by external systems and not just by your internal madness. You know that you are going to change when you're in a relationship. You're not the same person you were before. And you say, well, that must be because of the other person. No, it's because of the relationship. You see, systemic thinking perceives the individual as part of bigger and bigger concentric systems. The smaller and more obvious systems include your family, which shapes your relational identity, and your partner relationship, which is obviously what we're focusing on tonight here tonight. But you're also part of a wider system. You're part of a, a community. You're part of a, a, a maybe a religious group, a gender, a, a nationality, an ethnicity. So if you look at your life from a sociological or even anthropological perspective, you're going to be shocked as to how much your feelings, your beliefs, your behaviors are shaped and they're impacted by the concentric circles around you. And once people start to see that their, and let's say their partner's beliefs and behaviors are more holistic, they're more sociological. They begin to understand that it's not that they're broken. It's not pathological, but that the invisible 
Systemic forces create the current reality and they prevent change. You are holding your own focus, your own forward thinking back. You are the common denominator in these failures. I can't say it enough and I know it hurts. And I'm not saying it because I wanna hurt you. I'm just saying it because it's an important thing to hear and you cannot hear it enough. That this is your life and this is your choices. And what's gonna happen is, the moment you start looking at yourself, let's take a look at, let's, I don't know, Greek mythology. Let's say it's your hero's journey. So let's, instead of looking at the negative, which is very hard to hear, Let's look at it as your hero's journey. That it's your journey towards personal and relational change. I think this is going to also help you be better prepared for the pushbacks that come from the system whenever you try to adopt real change. So why so much push pushback? Why are people not wanting you to change? So I think in order to understand this, we need to understand why systems hate change. In psychology, it's called homeostasis. Why do systems hate change? Why do we create, why do we create routines in our life and those routines hate change? And I think this is a really important idea that impacts so many people and so many relationships. In general, there are going to be things that you're going to set up in your life or that you have in your life set up. And you rely on those things. You don't realize that you rely on those. You rely on your job. The moment you take your job out of your sphere, all of a sudden, what happens? It's harder for you to live because you don't have money. You don't have the necessary uh, tools. You don't have... Uh, um, whatever you need in order to be able to survive. The same thing is gonna be with your relationships. There's gonna be certain things that are gonna be hard for you to really see and to, to, to fully understand. When, when you have a partner, your partnership assumes complementary and opposite roles. That's what Dr. Romanelli calls the dance. These roles simultaneously induce and they maintain what's going to be called your relationship. So let's get a better picture of this. Imagine two dance partners. I'm not into dancing, but there are people who, who, are, who are very into ballroom dancing. And so when one partner steps with their left foot, automatically, in order to dance, the other partner must go towards them with their right foot. Each partner needs to use the opposite foot to maintain the dancing, or even more so to maintain the balance of the couple. And despite being the opposite foot, it's also the complementary foot. You hear what I'm saying? It's the opposite foot because you're facing each other but it's really the complementary foot because if you use the other foot, you wouldn't be dancing. I don't know what it would look like. So if one person used the same foot as their partner, what would probably end up happening is you both fall down. So in the dance, opposites are complementary because you're facing each other. In the dance, opposites are complementary. This is the same as to what happens in real life. When you assume a certain role, your partner is automatically going to assume the balancing, the dance. They're all automatically going to be the opposite. And these roles in your life are going to create a feedback loop. Every time one partner engages in a certain role, it reinforces the opposite role. So it becomes this kind of Literally a dance, right? And the, the, the one role is going to reinforce the other partner's role back and forth, and it becomes a never-ending cycle. 
there are many classic examples of this, these mutually reinforcing walls. There's a term called the pursuer and the distancer. There's, in, in a relationship, there's one person who's going to pursue and one person is going to distance, which means if one person is pursuing, naturally, the other person is going to distance. And the one, one of the couple says, well, why, why are you doing that? Well, they don't say that. Unfortunately, if we communicated properly, then we'd say it. But anyone who's been in a long-term relationship will know that that's going to happen at times. And, someone, and, and if you're really in touch with one another, you say, well, why are you distanced right now? Well, maybe someone's pursuing too much. There's, um, there's, there's one who may be a parent, the other one a child. That often is a, 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 an issue that happens in relationships. One takes a more of a parent's role and the other one a child's role. So let's, let, I'm trying to, I know I, I, I can see that you're like a little bit not sure what I'm saying. So let me give you an example. I'm thinking of an example. Let's imagine, give me a name. I have an example for you. Sure, give me an example, please. So um, there's two people that are dating for a really long time mm -hmm. and um, they go through a lot together. And um, can, can you hear that? Can you hear her? Maybe speak a little louder so people can, can hear you. Can everybody hear me? You know what? Or I can. Yeah, and then I'll, I'm just going to turn off. I'm going to turn off the my my mic, and you can turn on your mic. Perfect. Hi, I'm Olivia. I'm Rabbi Bernard's assistant. I have a situation that it's a hypothetical situation, but um, so you have two people that are dating for quite a while, and um, they go through a lot together, which, you know, a lot more than a usual, not usual couple, but a lot more traumatizing things than would a happy, stable, steady couple. And one of the people doesn't know how to deal with situations properly. So the other person who is more like logical and stable assumes that role of the parent because they are trying to be there for the other person that kind of seems like they're acting as though a child would act. So that dynamic really changes rather than like communicating with one another and just like assuming these roles that talking to each other. Um, I find that could kind of lead. What did you, uh, did you turn it off? Yeah, okay. So I think that, that that's a, that's a very, that, that's a, and it, a bit of an extreme example, but also a very good example. So let's try to bring it home a little more. Give me a name of a person. Steven. Steven. So Steven uh, starts to feel ignored or distanced by his partner. What's the name of his partner? Allison. Allison. So Allison, um, works very hard outside of the home. And she's often preoccupied and she's often distracted. And what Stephen sees is that that preoccupation of her work is a distance. And so Stephen starts pursuing Allison. And Alice starts, starts saying, Stephen is needy. Stephen is needy. Actually, Stephen is annoying. Stephen is suffocating me. And so Allison starts pulling away to create more space for herself. And what does that cause Stephen to do? He starts seeing rejection. He starts becoming anxious. And so he starts pursuing Allison more vigorously. You see what happened there? That was the dance. So all she was doing was working a little harder and all of a sudden it turned into a core relationship issue. What's important to understand in this dynamic is that both partners are equally responsible for maintaining the reality of the marriage or the reality of the relationship. 
No partner is a prisoner to the other, excluding, of course, abuse and violence. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a, 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 uh, an average situation. Obviously, I have to generalize because we're talking generally and specifically we can have a different conversation. This is majority of relationships. Now, the relationship system is always going to strive to maintain some sort of homeostasis. The only question is which one, which means if you're successfully step out of your role and you disrupt your current homeostasis in order to improve your relationship, you should be aware that something's going to happen. A new relationship is going to be formed. So you, there's going to be a new dance. So if you want to make a change in your relationship, you need to create a new dance. And that beginning of that, there's going to be a, an imbalance, right? So you may be stepping in the example of a dance, you may be stepping in the wrong directions. Because so you deciding to make a change doesn't mean that your partner is going to make the same change. You deciding that I want to become a better person, if you don't bring your partner along with you, then what happens is you're going to start growing apart instead of growing together. So how do you bring your partner with you? Ah, how do you bring your partner with you? That's the great question. The great question, how do you bring your partner with you? Well, you can never over communicate. And I mean this in relationships and I mean this in work. There's no such thing as over communicating. If you want to talk about being annoying, you should become annoying by communication. That's the kind of annoying that you should become because you can never over communicate. It doesn't exist. But what about those who are repetitive over and over and it's like, oh, okay, well then, over? so then communicate and say you're being repetitive. I heard that already, obviously in a nicer way than I just said it, I hope. <laughs> But you, you're, you're two people, and you're not just two people because there's so many other people around you in your sphere. You can't ignore the fact that there's other people. There's people that existed before you, and there's people that, that you're going to pick up along the way. And that's, it's this, you are constantly in a relationship kind of creating this dance. But if you're wanting to make a change, and change is great because change is important, because Relationships need to evolve. They don't evolve. Relationships change. Now, if one person is, is upset or frustrated and they say that the relationship needs to change, what happens is if they don't bring the other person along, then they're going to grow apart. So you need to be able to grow apart. What Dr. Romanelli says is that this idea called secondary gains. Anytime you have a secondary gain from your partner being in a certain place, in a certain situation, you're going to want to leave it that way. And the moment that partner changes and you lose that gain, you're going to really mess things up. So a lot of people don't want to change a good thing. I'll give you an example. I have couples who will come to me to get married and they've never had a serious conversation because there were too many secondary gains in not having a serious conversation. And some of you are thinking that's insane. It's not insane. There's second gain, secondary gains. In order, in order to make a change, there must be more losses than gains. As long as there's more gains than losses, the change won't happen. Let's talk about that. In order to make a change, there needs to be more losses than gains. As long as there's more gains than losses, change won't happen. Relationships don't evolve. They change. Relationships don't evolve. If you allow the relationship to evolve, you're going to grow apart. It needs to be something that is done consciously. And you're thinking to yourself, so why do I even want to get into it? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. I'm not making choices for you. But if I'm... If I'm uh, <laughs> uninspiring about relationships right now. Um, it's not my intention. Let's talk about the secondary gains idea. And I'm going to be finished in a few minutes, and then we're going to go on to the questions. 
For every role that you take in your relationship, there's going to be a secondary gain and a secondary loss. Secondary gains are the unavoidable perks of your role. And you may or may not be consciously aware of those. Now, this is the important part. There is a secondary gain for every voluntary role. There's a secondary gain for every voluntary role. I'm going to explain this. Even if the role includes pain and uneasiness, and every role will include some kind of joy and some kind of pain. A lot of people make the assumption that every behavior and pattern that we adopt has to have a positive intention or else we wouldn't have adopted it. That may, not, may or not be true. It could be that it's true, but it may also not be true. I think this idea for a lot of couples becomes surprising, especially someone or a couple who, who sees themselves as hurt or disrespected or suffering. But all you have to do is see, see what's there. We all have a secondary gain from the dynamic of our relationship. No matter how bad it seems, if you choose to see every role and the positive intention behind it, then you're gonna end up being able to find more compassion. So what I'm asking you to do is that whatever happens, instead of defaulting to the negative, default to the positive. Because gains are going to have a tangible good. I'll give you an example, a workaholic, it, should be able to have gains with respect to money or with respect to respect. Other times, the gains are a protection against maybe a, a negative emotion. Like the workaholic uh, protected themselves from being vulnerable with their partner. That's why they're spending more time out of the relationship than in the relationship. Secondary gains, what they are is their blind spots. They're blind spots that prevent most of us from making changes in our lives. And it's usually the more complaining partner that ignores or denies or isn't aware of the secondary gains, which means we push the gas pedal to make changes, but our secondary gains make us slam on the brakes at the same time. And so we get nowhere. It's a positive correlation. The more secondary gains the partner has, the more they're going to re resist the change in the relationship. Secondary losses is very similar. For example, uh, their taxes, right? Tax is a secondary loss. Can you avoid it? You can't avoid it. Right, exactly. So let me give you a couple of examples of what I would call a secondary loss. Um, no partnership. Not satisfied emotionally, physically in the relationship. My voice isn't heard. No respect for my partner. No respect for my partner's family. I'm lonely, I have no one to lean on. Pain, anxiety, fear, no communication. I'm not enlisting empathy. No one's interested in me. Pessimistic, I'm stuck. I'm not fulfilling myself. You get, an, you, you get this? I'm bored, I'm not being challenged. My pain is not being respected. I'm taken for granted. What's a secondary gain? A secondary gain is, an example is a sense of superiority over my partner. Like, I'm the better catch. 
That's a secondary gain. If you felt ever like I'm the better catch, you've had a secondary gain. Or I always have an excuse why I'm not growing, an alibi. I have someone or something to blame for whatever happens. I'm a legend in my own mind. In my mind, I have so much potential, but because of my partner and because of my relationship, I'm not able to fulfill my potential. I have control over myself with a relationship. My partner doesn't really know me. You know what I do for you? Being the martyr, what we call the martyr, the victim. I'm stuck in this dead relationship. You know what I, you know what I do for you? Secondary gains are too much attention. These are just examples of secondary gains. And so today, what I really wanted to do for you is kind of set up this little picture. And I think you're seeing where I'm going with this, of the dynamics of relationship, the dance of the relationship, the gains and the losses of relationship, and how that whole idea can come into fruition. Now, I know good and well that I have only touched and I probably opened up a lot more cans of worms for you tonight than, than anything else. But that was the idea. The idea is to maybe expose or to give you an idea of perhaps a part of your relationship or a part of relationships that you don't often think about. And you say, well, I'm okay. Relationships don't just happen. Two people in a relationship make that relationship happen. They don't happen by themselves. And so anything that we can do conscious instead of passive is so much better than anything that we can do without that. I feel like I've been, my monologue has been long enough. Everyone's already getting uh, the jitters. So let's go to the fun part. Let's go to questions. So you're welcome to private message. I guess you can private message me questions here if you want me to, if you don't want me to see it. I have Olivia right next to me who's writing down lots of questions and I have a bowl full of questions here. So I'm going to start tonight. You're welcome to uh, throw it in the notes, throw it in, throw it in here. Let's get a bunch in here. I don't know who said any of these. And let's get some of these questions out this evening. First question, question number one. How do we keep or even help restore the faith in having a basharit after so many failed relationships and dates? The first thing that I want to say to you is that I, I feel you. It's very hard. If you've had a lot of failures, a failure at anything, and you keep on trying, it's a miracle. So you have to give yourself credit for even after all the failures for continuing to try. That's a very beautiful thing. That's a really wonderful thing. So the I think the fact that you're still here, if you're here, it means you're still trying. Because if you weren't here, I don't, I don't think anyone coerced you into being here. I know maybe one person had their arm twisted to be here tonight, but that's about it. So if you're here, what I'm saying to you is you don't have to have faith. You just have to, instead of saying, I'm here, whatever, say, whatever I do, I do with consciousness. I'm just going to do it. And it's, it's hard. That's what life is. Nobody said life was going to be easy. And so how do you restore your faith? You have to know that you're here. You, you have your question answered just all by yourself, just by being here and just by continuing to try, even as difficult as it is. And it's difficult. And I think that so many of us here can relate to this question and how difficult this question is and how difficult the situation is. But thank you for that question. Um, somebody just wrote, what is a secondary gain? Did everybody understand what secondary gains are? Um, what, what I'll do is I'm gonna compile a list. I actually did compile a list. I'm going to throw out some secondary gains here. This is just uh, 
I'm going to post it here. And for those of you who are here in person, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll show it to you. But this is an example, and I'm posting here on the chat. Why did that not work? Why did that not work? Let's try that again. Okay, it's not working, but I will, I will send out, I have a list that I compiled of secondary gains. Okay, next question. What are some ways to give yourself clarity when someone won't give it to you? When you say clarity, I'm assuming you mean closure, because that's usually what clarity means. When someone says, I need clarity, it means I need closure. So there's a couple ways of getting, before I go to closure, I'm going to go to clarity. If you're in a relationship and you cannot see beyond that relationship, you need to take a break from the relationship. It's a very good thing. It's not a bad thing. You can say, I need to find clarity. And what you do is you step away from the relationship for a few days, no communication, no texting, no calling. You take a, a, a cold break. And then you see, do I miss that person? Do I miss them? Do I see that there's something missing in my life? And if you step away from the relationship for a few days and there's something missing in your life, then you know that this is the person for you. It's clear. That's clarity. What if that person doesn't want you? If that person doesn't want you, then what are you pursuing? So then that's where I'm going to say clarity is really closure. That's what you is coming to terms with the fact that it takes two to be in the dance. This dance of relationship that we're talking about takes two. If you're in the dance and the other one's not dancing, happy birthday, my friends. How about um, if you guys break up and nobody provides closure? Like if someone can't provide closure to the other person. So if the person can't provide closure, there could be one of two reasons. They're not able to, and that's just because you got into a relationship with someone who's not emotionally able to provide closure. And I'm sorry for you, but it happens. You're going to have to live with the fact that someone is not emotionally able to provide closure. Or it's because you, the, the, race, the, the dance of the relationship, your relationship dynamic, didn't allow for that level of communication. So if that's the case, it may be good if you are someone and you feel like your relationship can, you can communicate in it, then I think it's a good idea for you to have a, a closure breakfast. It's not a bad thing. Or a phone call. I don't like phone calls so much when it comes to closure because you, you, you were nice enough to be, I mean, especially if you saw each other in person, if you never saw each other in person, fine. But if you've seen each other in person, you were nice enough to get in together when it was good. Why can't you get together to close? And I know it's hard, but that would be really good because it allows the two of you to have a clean break and to say, this is wonderful. And, and I know you're going to hate me for this, some of you, but you can't be friends. You can't be friends. It doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work that way. You, what you're doing is you end up hiding emotionally in those friendships and you can't move on. If you want to move on and be able to get into a serious relationship, you need to break away from your previous relationship. As long as you're holding, and there, by the way, there are people who hold their past relationships in their head, which means the other person moved on, could be married already, can have kids already, and you're still married to them in your head. So that's the best way to move on. what? So what's the best way to move on? You have to move on. In that case, look, the easiest way to move on is when the other person gets into a serious relationship. When you hear the person you dated got engaged, it's like, okay, that's it, it is. I, I'm sure some of you can relate to this. It's like a, an existential moment. It's like, okay, as long as they're not engaged, like, or as long as they exist somewhere, like maybe it could happen again. And you're still married. There's a lot of people who are married to people in their head. And you will never be able to move on if you are holding out or waiting for someone or married to someone in your head. And that's a really difficult thing. Mm -hmm. So what the closure, what the break does is it allows you to move forward. I always say it's a good thing a month for every year that you're together. Like I would not get into a relationship. There's a couple exceptions to it, but generally, again, I am generalizing in this class. But a month for every year is a good idea. So if you're in a relationship for five years, you should give it five months. What about a couple months? 
as soon as I have a door. Huh? About a couple of months or something. If it's a couple of months, then give it a few, give it a few, few weeks. weeks. Don't, don't, don't just go one to the other. I would say minimum a month. If you're in a relationship that was a few months, give it a minimum, minimum a month. It's less than a year, a month. Okay, and I, I, I know this is hard, but uh, I want to at least give you no. Okay. Okay. What's next? Can it be possible to have a healthy relationship with someone if you're unable to own up to your own faults and mistakes? Yes, it is possible to have a relationship with someone if you're not able to own up to your own faults and mistakes. It's just the person probably is going to be in that relationship for one of two reasons. The secondary gains of that person being in that relationship is they like a fixer upper or they see potential in you. A lot of people get into relationships for the potential they see in the other person. I think that's not a health, it's not a healthy relationship. You asked healthy relationship. I don't think that's a healthy relationship. When you get into, if you want to be in a healthy relationship, and I'm underlying the word healthy, then you have to know from the beginning that you cannot change the person you're in a relationship with. You can never change them. You have to be okay with who they are. If they change, added bonus, but you have to be okay with who they are. Okay. Do I have anything more to say about a relationship is not a negotiation? So I say this quite often, that a relationship is not a negotiation. What I mean by not a negotiation is that when people use the word settling down, don't settle down. If you don't, if you are in a relationship and you think you're the better catch in the relationship, shame on you. Shame on you. If you think you're the better catch in the relationship, darn. Why? You, if, if you're in a relationship, you need to think that this person you're in a relationship thing is with is the greatest thing that ever happened to the world since sliced challah. And slice challah, that was good. But if you're in a relationship with them, they are the greatest thing that ever happened to the world. If you think this person is lucky enough to have me as a partner, you know what I have to say to you? We're both lucky to have each other. No, that it's not your uh, business. Rabbi, That's not your you. business. What do we say? 50-50. It's you know? not your business. You can't decide what the other person thinks. You have to decide for yourself. So I go in thinking, I'm hot shit. I know I'm hot shit. So, but I can't but, think, uh, you know, she's the best. I think I'm also good. Otherwise, my self-esteem is going to go down and I'm going to feel shit about myself. You don't need to, you need, you don't need to have your self-esteem based on her. I got to boost myself up. You don't have to, to boost, boost yourself up based it's on like her. It's like the sun and the moon. Sun, you uh, you know, rays off the moon. It shines. So I got to be shining. So I have a good idea. What are you? The sun or the moon? Both. What are you? <laughs> He's both. He's both. The sun and the moon. Oh, now I know. Get married to yourself. <laughs> Why? You're the, you're you're both. I want someone else who's both too. We want to both bounce off of each other. I don't want to be like, okay, yes, she's the everything, but. If you don't think there's something missing in your life, you're not going to need anything to fill it. If you're everything and a can of and a can of soup, but you I'll go back to, to slice tala. <laughs> you have to be complete, don't you? It's not about being complete. You're missing the point. If there's nothing relationship, there needs to be space for the relationship. If you're complete, if you're everything you always wanted to be without the relationship you don't need the relationship stop clogging up the system stop dating these poor women that you're dating 
but I'm trying to find the one. You're not trying to find it. You're, you're clogging up the system. What? what if the other ones aren't the one? I'm going to, the minute I meet the one, I'll know. She'll be like, you know, my bashet. Do you know, you know what's great about fireworks? You know what's great about fireworks? You know, we just finished in the yeah. United States, 4th of July. Or Canada Day. Canada Day. You know what's great about fireworks? They're very high in the sky. So I'm floating high in the sky. If you're floating high in the sky, if you're waiting for fireworks to happen, I always have this dream that one day I'm going to do this because people are always waiting for the sparks, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go on a date and I'm secretly right behind the tuchas of the person. I'm going to take a little thing, I'm going to light, and all of a sudden the sparks are going to fly. See, there you got your sparks. <laughs> But there has to be sparks. You go on a date these days. How girl... are you going to have sparks if you desensitize yourself you so much? How? No, Tell no, me, no. where are the sparks left? But you, you You're so happen. desensitized. Like I've been to on dates. Someone. Their, the girl doesn't even talk. Like, what am I going to do? I'm, like, I'm talking and like asking questions. Yeah, but that's not, that's not, like I knew somebody who was so funny. He used to tell me, I don't love my girlfriend. I don't love my girlfriend. And he's like, but you know, I researched and I researched this and sparks are supposed to come in this amount of time and in this and that. So at a certain point, it's like basing it all off that is like, like saying desensitizing yeah. yourself. Yeah. Okay. The yeah. problem is, yeah. okay, look, when I, when I got married, Sarah was the first relationship I ever had with someone with the opposite gender. So of course there's going to be sparks, but if you've had other relationships and many other relationships over the years, you've so desensitized yourself, you're never going to be able to, to find that spark. I'm not saying it doesn't ever happen, but you shouldn't expect that it's going to happen. And so unless there's something truly missing in your life, you're not going to have any desire to have anything else. That person that you want in your life, that you're looking for, mm -hmm. is going to fill a huge void in your life. If you don't feel that loneliness, and that was something that was very beautiful, uh, a little silver lining that happened in COVID, because a lot of people before COVID, they, they filled their lives up with lots of wonderful things, and they were able to find ways of coping. But all of a sudden, we got into lockdown. And the moment we got into lockdown, people realized they're truly lonely. And that need created a lot of relationships. That need, that loneliness created a lot of relationships. What? It also didn't. I couldn't even hold the door open for somebody to walk into like a few like, no, I'm okay. I'm okay. You know? No, but you, 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 holding the door, scared. holding the door open for someone, it, it is not what I'm talking. About. I'm talking about that it created this need that people felt that they needed to be in a relationship. A lot of people who didn't feel that need before. Yeah, I wanted to ask about the void thing because I feel like sometimes when you when you seek somebody to fill that void, I don't think it's, in my, in my opinion, I don't know if that's like healthy because it's, I've seen it happen to like, whether it be like myself or like my friends when they're they have a void in them where they don't know why that void is there and they seek somebody else to fill that void it ends up being like you know this whole thing where it's like if they can't fill the void in the way where they want them to mm -hmm. it's not it's not there's so many things wrong with just that i think like seeking somebody to help fill that is not I don't know. I don't see it. So, like that. so I think that that that's a very good. So, what, what, just to give a summary for those who didn't hear, that there's a lot of people who try to fill that void in their own way, right? That's what you're trying to say. No, I'm I trying can... to say like if you seek out a relationship with somebody for them to fill that void within you, and you don't even know why that void is there, and you like, there's just I I don't find it a good way to do things. So, what now. you're talking about is expectations. Yes. The no. loneliness, the loneliness doesn't doesn't equal expectation. You can still have a, a feeling, an internal feeling of loneliness that you need someone without having an expectation of who that person or what that person is. But I, I it's like seeking somebody to fill a void. Like I've I've seen it like not result in a good way. That's what I'm trying to say. It's like, do you think it's dangerous when people seek somebody not because they are like i'm i'm healthy i love myself i'm comfortable where i'm at and i would like something more or they're just seeking somebody because they feel that loneliness and that void you know i don't think that's like a good i don't know it's not a healthy relationship it's already headed toward disaster it, it i find that no, leads to a lot of codependence um, we, we, we like to be social beings well we are if we didn't have 
or even able to talk with people that you're essentially filling a void once you get into a relationship in a sense, no? I mean, doesn't that kind of make sense? Um, maybe. Regardless of whatever void you may think that is. Maybe. Um, look, I, I, so somebody asked, did it cause many breakups as well? It did cause many breakups because it became very real that the void was there even if you were in a relationship. So people who had that void in the relationship, they realized, well, what am I doing? So if so, where a lot of couples were able to just avoid each other for many years and, and make it work, when you put everybody together in one room or one place for a long period of time and they have to actually face each other, well, it can cause good and bad and ugly. Um, somebody else says, with no, feed, there, with no void, there's no need. That's exactly what I'm saying. With no void, there's no need. Thank you. Okay, let's go on. Next question. There's a lot of questions here, so I'll try to get to. I'll try to get to. Wow. Okay. Secondary gains. Secondary gains. I realized I have made my past girlfriends have self-esteem issues by unconsciously saying things, um, like I took her for shopping, cooked for her, spoke about my diet. How do I stop this pattern? I don't truly see the issue of this question, but I'm, I'm just gonna make a couple of assumptions. I'm assuming what you're saying is that you created, you took up too much space in the relationship and didn't allow space for the other person. So that is a secondary gain for you that became a secondary loss for the other person. So in order to create a relationship, you can't talk to yourself. You ever, you ever meet, I'm sure you know people like this. Whenever you speak to them, they're not really speaking to you. They're just speaking at you. Like it could be you or it could be anybody else in the world. It, it could be anybody else in the world. They're just wanting to talk. Literally, they're looking at you and you are their free therapist at this moment. And the moment you leave, there's going to be another free therapist that's going to walk into their life and you're going to, that person will be the next free therapist. They're not, they don't, or, or somebody who's trying to sell salespeople. People trying to sell you something. They're not, you know, somebody calls me up and, and I try to be nice. I mean, sometimes you can't be nice to them, unfortunately, but they call you up and they don't let you get a word in edgewise. Like I ask a question, a simple question. Like, okay, you have to, you have to say yes now. And then we'll, you know, is there, can you email me? And, but you know, a lot of people who, who, uh, who like this thing, I didn't ask that question. You're listen to me a second. I want to know, can you email me the information? Like they literally won't let you get a word and they're just continuing, you know, the next line of the script and the next line of the script. If someone's talking at you, that's not a relationship. That's not a relationship. Relationship is two people listening to each other. The greatest, the greatest gift that I can give you, this person who has had problems with their girlfriend's self-esteem is whenever your girlfriend starts talking, you listen, don't say a word. And then when they're done, you say, I like that. Can I hear more? And then they continue talking. And then you say, that's great. Can I hear more? What if you don't have that, that interest in hearing what they want to say? <laughs> Why are you in the relationship if you have no interest in hearing what they have to say? I think a lot of people like get into relationships yeah. and they don't really yeah. have an interest in yeah. the other person. If you're full of yourself, there's no space for someone else. If you only like listening to your own voice, there's going to be no space for anyone else to be in a relationship. Thank you very much. I'd like to rest my case. I'm happy we can now all go home. That's exactly what I'm saying. If you can't, if you're listening to someone that you're in a relationship with, and you can't then say, tell me more, I really like listening to your voice. If you can't do that, it has nothing to do with them. It has to do with you. When you're in a relationship with someone, you need to enjoy their company. Because majority of, if I, you know, it's so funny because so many singles come with these long lists. 
lists and lists of things. But we all know that, that none of that really matters because at the end of the day, a lot of relationship is spent enjoying one another's company. That's why I even say to very religious couples who they're on the religious dating system, they're gonna start off by going to a hotel or they're gonna have a conversation. But I want, if a religious couple is dating, I want them to have a shared experience as soon as possible because you need to, when you date, going to a movie is not a date. When you're dating, what you want to do, it's fine. You can go to a movie, but it's not a date. Mm -hmm. When you're dating, you want to have a shared experience. That's the most important part of dating. Do you like just being together, doing nothing together? Mm -hmm. Whatever it is. Because that is a lot of what life is. Can I just appreciate being in the other's presence? You know those awkward silences? Those are okay. The moment you get over the awkward silence, you can just say, is this is an awkward silence and laugh about it. The moment you get over the awkward silence in the beginning of that relationship, the better it is because that's what life is. It's full of awkward silences. It's full of lots of listening. So the greatest thing I can say to you is that when she's finished talking, say, tell me more. Just say it every time. Because so often we're waiting for the other person to finish talking so we can jump in because we've been waiting for five minutes to say what we have to say. Forget about it. Don't start developing your answers when other person's talking. Listen, listen. Sorry, I get very emotional about it, but I see it so often. You okay? We're all yeah, still friends. Yeah, we're, we're, all, we're, we're all, all still friends. friends. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, next question. When should a couple start discussing their long-term goals? It depends on the couple. Um, I would definitely say that it's hard to break that ice. The sooner you break it, it's like ripping off the Band-Aid. It's either, it's gonna have to come off. So do it fast or do it slow. So it, I know that it's very hard and I know that our society is set up not to care about long-term relationships, but secretly deep down, most of us, I'm not saying all of us, but most of us want that. So it's okay. Don't be scared. Don't be scared you're going to stare, scare the other person off. Mm -hmm. So at some point, you don't have to be the first date, maybe not the second or the third, but at some point early on in your relationship, you need, it needs to go to a place where you start talking about long-term. The fact that it's not one or two or three. I've seen it so often where couples will be engaged. You know, when, when uh, a lot of couples, before they get married, I do a, uh, an analysis of the strengths and weaknesses of the relationship. So they each fill out a questionnaire, and then I create an analysis of the strengths and weaknesses of the relationship. So there's a lot of basic questions on the questionnaire, not complicated questions. Some of them are more complicated, but most of them are pretty basic. Right. Every, every couple has strengths and weaknesses. There's no such thing as bad and good. But what I want before the couple gets married is that they should know what the strengths and weaknesses are so that they know what they're dealing with. That's a very important thing that an engaged couple needs to know. But when I get back these two questionnaires and I have one of them, simple question, how many children do you want? Now you'd think that they were dating how long? A year and a half, two years? Now with COVID, four years? They would have had that conversation at some point, you'd think, right? It's pretty obvious. And he says zero and she says three. Just had one a couple of days ago. She said zero, he said two. It hasn't happened once or twice. It's happened a couple of times. If they're not having that kind of conversation and they're engaged, then what other kind of conversations aren't they having? It's not scary. This is real life. It's your life. 
live it. So how soon should you talk about like religious levels, Kashrut? Should you talk about it a month in? Well, it's probably going to become a big issue if you're not on the same page two months in. So don't you want to talk about it one week in? I don't understand why it's it's it should be a conversation before you even start. If you're not starting at least a little bit of the same page, right? Even people who are here tonight, I ask them, give your age range and your religious level because it should be an obvious. And I'm not saying that, I mean, there are people of varying religious levels that can make it work, but the more steps you have, relationships are complicated. The more obstacles you put in the way, the harder it's going to be. Do you feel it's possible to have a healthy relationship with someone who is divorced and or their parents are divorced? I don't know if I, I'm not gonna answer this based on how I feel. I will tell you there's some, there are some stats for this. Um, there are some studies that have been done that, that show that people who, um, the divorce rate right now in the United States is a little over, a little under 60% which is terrible. That means the odds of staying married are less than the odds of getting divorced. Very sad. I hope I'm helping change that, but it's one person at a time, one couple at a time. If you've been divorced already, the odds are even more. If you're from a divorced home, the odds are even more. I don't remember offhand, but I can get you those exact numbers. They're very high. They're very, very high. And, and the reason why is because in order to have a a, a happy long-term relationship, you need to have a model for that relationship. So if you don't have a healthy model in your life for that, it's going to be very hard for you to be in a relationship like that. So you, if you don't have a healthy model, you need to get a healthy model. Most kids whose parents are divorced think it's their fault. If you think that your parents' divorce is your fault, it's going to be very hard for you to change that and get into a, a healthy relationship. So you have to say to yourself, it's not your fault because it's never the kid's fault. We all know that we're adults. You can only be 12 years old until you're 12. But after you're 12 years old, you are responsible. At 13 years old, you're start with being responsible for your own actions. Okay, fine, 18 years old, we're all over 18. I wouldn't care what age, at some point, you have to say, I'm responsible for my own actions. So if I don't know how to be in a relationship, I gotta learn how to be in a relationship. Hence, thank you for being here tonight. And that's okay. You, a lot of this stuff used to be innate. Today, it's not innate. That's one of the reasons why I sit here and talk like this, because it's not obvious. So many things that should be obvious, and a lot of what I'm saying is obvious, but it's just not obvious in our society. So if you're from a, if you're from a divorced home, you have to have a role model a physical role model for relationships. Say, that's a marriage that I like. I can see myself having a marriage like that. And then you go to that couple and you interview them. You say, say to them, you are my example of a healthy relationship. Tell me how you do it. I can't hear it. What, she's always right. Common sense is not so common. Oh, common sense <laughs> is not so common. Yes, exactly. Common sense is not so common. Exactly. Um, John Gottman, if you don't know him, learn about him. He is, his studies are amazing. And what he's done for marriage is unbelievable. And his book, The Seven Habits That Make Marriage Work is my favorite book on relationships. And no, he doesn't pay me anything to say that. <laughs> and I think that every couple that's in a serious relationship should buy that book and sit down together and read it together, page by page. Read it out loud mm -hmm. and talk about it. There's other books also I'd recommend, but that if there's only one book that you read together, read that book together. And he says that one of the ways that a child of a, a divorced home can change the trajectory of their relationship. And divorce also means if you grew up in a home where there was a lot of fighting between your parents, 
the same thing. That means that they were divorced, but still living together. That a child needs to do three things. Number one, needs to say, it wasn't my fault. Number two, decide what they would do differently. And number three, have a healthy role model. And those three things will change the trajectory of your relationships. Hope I answered that well. Yes, it is. The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work by John Gottman. Absolutely. Okay, next question. Are we okay? We, I have 10 minutes here. So I'm going to try to get to all these questions. And if you have, I, I see some people writing in the chat. If there's anything there, Olivia, in the chat that I need to see, I haven't been looking, but I want to make sure I get down at least to all these and tell me if there's anything I have to add. What if you have the talk and she agrees to compromise or do something for you? For example, let's say you have a talk and she agrees to do Shabbat or keep kosher for you. Is a compromise good or will she resent it down the line? First of all, it's a very good question because it's something that comes up a lot. I see this a lot. You should not be getting into a relationship for what you will do, what you will compromise, what the potential will be. If she's not doing it now, she won't do it later. If she's not doing it for herself, she won't do it for you. She'll do it for you for as long as the honeymoon lasts, but that's it. So if you expect, if you're non-negotiable, I'm going to just use your, whatever this person's question. If you're non-negotiable, Shabbat and kosher, you should not be getting into a relationship with anyone who's not Shabbat and kosher. It's just non-negotiable. You, you can decide. I always say that you should have three non-negotiables. That's it. Or three things you can't live with and three things you can't live without. So essentially, there are really three non-negotiables that are six. But that's it. But you have to remember, for every non-negotiable you have, you have to negotiate in a lot of other things. So you can't have 50 non-negotiables because then you're going to marry yourself. <laughs> so if, if you... If that's a non-negotiable, which sounds like from the person who's asking this question that it is a non-negotiable, then you need to say from the onset that you only date someone who's Shabbat and kosher. It's not going to change. Was I clear enough with that? Okay. Hey, a couple questions here. Maybe I'll change. I'll save this one. A few questions on there. Okay. There's one question on there, and there's two questions on here. Good. Okay. A woman's parents do not like her boyfriend. Does that matter? And will it affect the relationship? If you say it's only the man and woman, reality is family and friends, will that influence their views? Okay. So if your parents don't like, <laughs> it reminds me of that joke. It's like a, rabbi, a typical rabbi joke. I think it's probably number 125 or something like that, where, uh, where the guy keeps on bringing home these girls and his mother hates every single one of them. And then he finally says, you know what? I've got an idea. He goes out and he finds this girl who looks just like his mother, who talks like his mother, who acts like his mother. It's perfect. It's like this perfect spinning image, younger version of his mom. Comes home, his mom falls in love with her. There's only one problem, his dad hates her. <laughs> so, um, it's a very, yes. The answer is yes. One, it's very interesting that the Torah, when it refers to marriage, it refers to the man must, what? Separate from his parents and cleave to the woman and they shall become one flesh. That's the way the Torah says it. And obviously the Torah is not just saying it because it's a nice idea, because it's a, it's a problem. Yes, you, you, you mothers, have a hard time with this. And I to all the mothers out there, I wish you a lot of a lot of good in your life. But as long as you're the most important woman in your son's life, there's no space for any other woman. It's a really hard thing. I know it's hard and I know you love your sons. But the greatest thing you can do for them is let them go. He, he can't have two primary women in his life. And that's why the Torah says he has to separate. 
And so if your mother, very often there's secondary gains and secondary losses and mothers, especially mothers who are a little emotional, have a hard time with that. What if the siblings don't like them? What if the siblings don't like them? There's secondary losses and secondary gains about that too. I'll give you an example. I know of someone who had come to me and he was the last sibling of his family not married. And I couldn't understand because he was already in his 40s and never married. And I couldn't understand it. It didn't make any sense to me. And then I realized that every single time he brought a girl home, the siblings would would say terrible, not for you and convince him, why not? Why? Because he was the babysitter. He was the one who was taking care of their homes when they went to Florida. He was the one who they would lose. If this guy would get married, they would lose their number one help. So it, that was their secondary gain to avoid him. Now they were being very selfish. And I ended up confronting him and telling him that. And he agreed with me that I was right. And I said, okay, well, you have to decide that. You have to decide. And, and I said, I think you really need to stop telling your siblings about your relationships. Mm -hmm. And he did that. And, and, and he is in a serious relationship now. But it's a very hard thing. It's a very hard thing. Remember, you, you, you hope and you wish that everyone has your best interest in mind. But it doesn't always happen that way. Not always does everyone have your best interest in mind. And it's not even their fault. They're not even doing consciously. They're doing subconsciously. I don't think his, his siblings were being malicious about it. It was just a reality. The reality was is that they were going to lose the number one babysitter, the number one house sitter, and the number one person who would come mow their lawn if the guy would get into a relationship. So they liked their life. And what the way. If, what if it wasn't about that? What if it was just they, they really just didn't like the guy? He thought they were not for you. Okay. What I would say, and this is my opinion from my observations, from my experiences, from watching lots of relationships over the years. When you're in a relationship, you're allowed to take advice from three people to the exclusion of all others. Three people. You get a friend, a parent or sibling, and a mentor. That's it. It's not a survey. It's not something you, you get three people who you listen to. Each one of them has a different role. You have to decide. You can't decide. You have to decide before you get into the relationship who these people are. Mentor is very important because you need someone who you can who can give you advice, especially things. There's things that happen. You have to be able to ask somebody honestly. The parent or older sibling or younger or sibling role, that's someone who knows you for your whole life and, and has your best interest in mind. And then there's a friend. The friend is someone who's your equal, who you can bounce something off. So you need those three. It's like a, a 360 experience, but it's not 10 people. It's not 20 people. And it's not sitting around with the siblings having a conversation about your, your, your girlfriend or your boyfriend. You get three people. And these three people, need to, you, they need to have... So the mentor, the very most important thing that the mentor needs is to believe in marriage, mm -hmm. if you believe in marriage. The most important thing that the... Um, the, the older sibling or the, the parent needs is to really want your best interest in mind, want you to get into a, a healthy relationship. If they don't have your best interest in mind, not a good idea. And the most important, the friend is also needs to have your best interest in mind. That's it. That's all they need. They don't have to be professionals. They don't have to be therapists. They don't have to be rabbis. It could be somebody who has your best interest, who wants you to get married, who wants to see you happy. It could be a, a family friend doesn't matter, but somebody who you trust, who you'll listen to, and that's it. It's not a survey. Um, is it possible to have a healthy relationship with a guy who is divorced once or twice and never did the work to understand his part in it or to acknowledge the work on his issues? The answer is yes, it is possible but it's not possible. If you are asking this question, you obviously know something. Instead of confronting me and this class about it, confront them about it. And one of two things are gonna happen. 
either they're going to dance differently or they're going to break up. Either way, I say is good. Because if this is bothering you, so it you have a couple strikes against you with the fact that they've been divorced. Not terrible. It could be that they could be in a good relationship. It's happened. But you do have some strikes against you. So I think it's important to, to, uh, to confront them about this. It is, it is 9.30. And I know we have a couple more questions and things coming in. But this has been really wonderful. Thank you for being here. For those of you who, uh, who are here with me in person, we'll have some social time. But we're going to end uh, the, the Zoom now. And a very, very special thanks to Marie's and to BG Communications for, uh, for sponsoring tonight's class. And if you would like uh, another class uh, like this, you're welcome to, uh, to let me know. And not only uh, you can let me know, but you can even decide the topic. You can sponsor it and decide a topic. Wow. Look at that. That's, that's how I'm doing it. It's that simple right now. And so it's really, really a pleasure. And thank you, thank you, Maries. And uh, I will be sending out to the recording to everybody who, who registered for tonight, both in person. So you'll be able to have this for future reference. And thank you also for those of you in person for bearing with me for those of you on the Zoom and for those of you on the Zoom for bearing with me. This is the first time we tried this hybrid, my first relationships class in person in over three years. And so uh, I think uh, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was gonna be to have the both. And so I hope to be doing this a lot more often. And obviously as per always, I'm here and uh, I hope to continue this. So for now, I will, um, I, I will sign off. So have a good night, all you Zoom people.